All right. Well, we can go ahead and get started. It's 10 3. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for making it here today to learn about uh, wildfire preparedness. Um, Hispanic Access Foundation is hosting this along with Doug Green from Headwaters Economics. And I'll pass it over to Doug to introduce himself. And before he starts, sorry, once again, we do have Natalia Vasquez, our wonderful interpreter, who's going to be interpreting in Spanish. All right, Doug, the floor is yours. Thanks, Vanessa. Did you want to um, do introductions all the way around, or should I just jump into this? I think you should just jump in okay. in terms of time sync. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen then right now. All right. That look good? Perfect. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Doug Green. I am the program manager for the Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire program, which, uh, which is the CPAW program. We're a program uh, managed by Headwaters Economics, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, group out of Bozeman, Montana, that takes on a lot of high-level community issues dealing with hazards, dealing with vulnerabilities, um, and different things like that, and um, try to find solutions for those issues. Um, the CPOP program is a free program. We work with communities around the country in um, wildfire preparedness, trying to come up with solutions to reduce their risk for wildfire through education, through outreach, communication, regulations, etc. So we, there's lots of tools in the toolbox, and we try to come up with uh, the tools that match that community, uh, again, to reduce their risk for wildfire. I'm actually based out of Bend, Oregon. Um, and my career includes about 27 years working for a structural fire department um, and wildland uh, fire mitigation. So thanks to everyone for being here. I'm excited about sharing this with you so you can then share it to the folks you guys work with. Um, jump here to the next slide. So what we're going to talk about this morning and what I'd like to share is how we can build wildfire adapted communities. Um, keeping a natural occurrence from becoming a human disaster. We always like to separate the wildfire from the disaster piece uh, because as we know, wildfires have been here for millennium or will continue to be here and, and are an important part of the ecosystem. And so the wildfires themselves are not the disaster. They become a disaster when they come into our communities. Um, they, they injure or kill people. They destroy our towns, our homes, um, our economies, et cetera. That's when, that's when a wildfire becomes a problem. Um, so I, I don't like using the term wildfire disaster all the time because there are ways we can separate that. And once we understand that a lot of us live in areas where wildfires are natural and have always been here, and if we can think about that and how we build our homes, how we prepare our homes, how we build our businesses and communities, we understand that wildfire is a natural part of that uh, process, then we can adapt to that and build and plan accordingly. And so that's kind of what the goal of what I want to talk about this morning is. As Jack Cohen, one of the premier scientists in wildfire said, uh, wildfires are inevitable, but wildfire disasters don't have to be. There is no way, no matter how many people and how much money we throw at wildfires, that we're ever going to stop them. It's just not possible. And wildfires are important. We, we know this, they're an important part of the ecosystem. Um, prior to when we started managing uh, our forests, um, when the uh, Native Americans were on here, they used fire um, throughout uh, the time they lived here to manage the ecosystems appropriately. When, um, Last hundred years or so, we came in and started putting out all the wildfires. That's when we uh, started with uh, the huge problems we've seen with wildfires on our public lands. And we know a lot of things about how wildfires have changed um, in the past uh, few decades. We know they're getting worse due to climate change. The climate's getting hotter. We're getting more wildfires. Uh, they're hotter wildfires, and they're becoming far more destructive than they ever have been. We also know that more and more homes, more people are building in, in wildfire uh, natural areas. 
people want to live in the forest, they want to live in the woods, or just because of economics, they're forced to move into those areas. So we have more and more homes being built in harm's way. We also understand the impacts of wildfire are unequal. We know that there are certain groups of people, certain populations out there that if a wildfire affects them, they do not have the resources to come out of the uh, impacts that wildfire like other um, parts of the population. Folks who live in manufactured or mobile home parks may not be insured. They may not have family members that can um, take them in while their home is being rebuilt if it can be rebuilt. We also know that some of the education and outreach of wildfire uh, are not getting to certain segments of the population like there are other segments of the population. So we know the um, impacts of wildfire and wildfire disasters are unequal. But we know how to do things better. And I'm gonna go through this pretty fast, but we know it, it, historically we've had a lot of fire issues in our nation. We've had entire cities that have burnt to the ground in the early 1900s, late 1800s. You know, we had the great Chicago fire. We had the San Francisco fire. We burnt entire cities to the ground and killed thousands of people, but we knew how to do it better. We knew by uh, building the right way, adopting codes, providing fire escapes, sprinkler systems, et cetera, we knew that we could keep this from happening again. And we have done that. We've built the right way. We've adapted to that. And we no longer see cities burn to the ground like we did 100 years ago. Same with flooding and hurricanes. We, we realize that there are ways we can build and adapt if we're going to live in those environments. And so now there's building codes. There's ways to build in those areas that if a hurricane or a flood comes through there, we have a better chance of surviving that and our homes have a better chance of surviving that um, than we did in the past. And same with earthquakes. You know, we know how to build homes that can survive earthquakes better. And there are codes and ordinances in place for that. So again, we've learned from the past and we know how to do it better and we know how to do it better with wildfire as well. And I always saw this slide in there because even when we were kids, we knew how to do it better. We knew that by building with the bricks instead of with wood and hay, that that structure was gonna last longer and that little piggy was gonna be happier in the long run. So we've known how to do it better. We just have not really put that into play and we're slowly um, learning how to do that and building our communities the right way. Real quick, I want to make sure everyone understands how communities and homes are burnt down. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. The first way is through flame contact. When we have a fire that comes from the forest or from a wild land area and impacts our homes directly. So flame contact is one way. It's similar to if you put a marshmallow inside the flame of a fire, it's going to burn. But we don't see a lot of homes burned down this way, although it is a per, it is perceived that that by the majority of the population that that is how most homes burn. That there's a big fire front that comes off the the wild lands and burns our communities to the ground, and that's just not the case um, in a lot of uh, disasters that have happened. We do not see fire coming in from public lands burning down our communities. The other way is through radiation. Again, if we have a structure burning or uh, a lot of fuels burning, we can get radiant heat to another structure and it will ignite that structure. And that's how you get these structure to structure ignitions that then can burn down entire communities. Because once you start getting structure to structure ignitions, um, the fire departments and the resources are then maxed out and they are more interested at that time in evacuation, getting people out of there than they are in putting those structures out. They just cannot um, they cannot manage more than a few structures at one time. So when you start getting this radiant heat, burning structures to structures, that's when you start losing communities. And that's why keeping that first structure from burning through the way we build them, through the way we manage the landscape around them is so important. So you don't have that heat going from one structure to the next to the next. So again, this is, you know, if you put a marshmallow, not in the fire, but near the fire, it's going to burn just through radiant heat. But by far, the most common ways we lose communities and we burn down homes is through embers. When a fire burns in a wildland area, it can shoot embers or firebrands up to four miles in front of that fire, depending on the wind. And when you have hundreds and thousands of those embers landing on homes, on wooden roofs, 
on gutters that have pine needles in them, on flammable vegetation in communities, you start having multiple homes burning to the ground because you cannot put those fires out with the limited resources of the fire department. And this is how most communities end up being destroyed is through embers. And if, if you take anything out of this conversation this morning is remembering that when you're looking at your homes, looking at your communities, is thinking, how am I gonna protect that from embers dropping on top of this? Are there places in my home or on my vegetation that can, track, that can entrap embers and that can be combustible and then start the home on fire? So that's really what we're gonna focus on today is how to keep embers from igniting structures and communities. Cause that's again, 90% of all homes are lost through ember ignitions. Real quick, I wanna, this is an example of how that works. Um, the, the Insurance Institute of Business and Home Safety built a number of side-by-side -side homes in uh, a big uh, airplane hangar. And they threw winds and embers at these homes. One side of the home was built with traditional building construction, wood siding. They used bark mulch material around the base, single pane windows, attic vents that didn't have uh, appropriate screening on them, et cetera. And the other side, they used just kind of normal building. They used hardy back cement based siding. They used gravel for um, the landscaping, double pane windows, et cetera. And they, they built a number of these, shot embers at them, which you'll see in a second. And as you can imagine, the results were kind of the same every time. You can see the embers being shot out of those giant fans um, at this. And within about a minute, you can see that already the landscaping has started to burn. The winds from those fires then push that landscape fire up onto more landscaping, onto the wooden siding, which then goes up into the attic, into the attic vents, which we store a lot of combustibles in, gets under the deck, to the wooden door, et cetera. And they did this multiple times and every time had the same result. Okay, and this was just because of the landscaping they used and the siding they used. And then every time the other building remained unscathed other than some smoke damage from the fire on the one next to it. So again, just kind of an example of what can happen when embers land on homes. Um, and again, with some simple landscape changes and simple siding changes, these structures can keep from being destroyed. Again, this is what I'm talking about. Any type of wildland fire we've gone to, you get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these embers that are launched through the air, launched in front of the fire, land on anything combustible, anything flammable, whether it be deck furniture, firewood, leaves in the gutter, uh, plants on the ground, and they start fires. And when you have hundreds of these fires starting in communities at one time, again, that's how you lose communities. So oh, real quick, again, just to show what I was talking about, when communities burn, in most cases, it is through embers and it is not through crown fires or through fires from direct flame contact. You can see here in a lot of these communities that end up um, being hit by wildfire, the homes are burnt to the ground, the structures are gone, but the vegetation is still green. These were not fires that came through the trees and then burnt the houses down. These were fires that burnt the houses and any trees that were burnt or uh, looks like they have been affected by heat here or caused because of the homes burning below them. So if we can stop these homes from burning, then we can keep these neighborhoods from being destroyed. So another example from down um, south of where I live in Southern Oregon. Again, you can see the trees are green. This was not a fire that came from the trees. This was a fire that came from the homes. The homes burnt, um, and the trees survived. So again, these were, these were ember fires that turned into structure to structure ignitions. And once you have that happening with the wind behind it, there's just no way to stop these things. So we got to stop them early on uh, before they get going. Again, kind of what I'm talking about, embers coming through and anything you got to remember, homes are really just a fuel package waiting to burn. They're built out of petroleum based materials in most cases. Sometimes a lot of wood, wood siding, wood roofs, wood decks, lawn furniture, flammable vegetation around it. Anything and everything 
that can burn, can trap embers, and that's how you can lose a home. So we need to be looking at our structures, at our homes, as, as if they were going to be hit by ember showers, and where will those embers collect and start that house on fire? So when we look at homes and how to harden homes and how to protect them from wildfire and build wildfire resilient communities, um, I always start from the top down from a home and work my way out. I think that's the easiest way when you're working with folks on trying to educate them on protecting their structures. Again, roofs are uh, a, a, a very vulnerable uh, component of the home, especially if they're made out of wood. They're a large surface area that can collect a lot of embers and also collect a lot of debris, pine needles, dead leaves, etc. Roofs should be class A if possible, asphalt or metal. Um, and any areas uh, around the roof where they can collect uh, embers, such as where, where the roof goes up against maybe a dormer, uh, things like that need to be protected by some type of metal sheathing, something so if embers collect against that, then that fascia, if it's wooden, does not ignite as well. We also look at gutters because that's what ends up collecting a lot of vegetation. And during a fire, if those embers roll down a roof, they will also collect in the gutter. And if you have a gutter that catches on fire because there's uh, flammable debris inside them, even if the gutter is metal, the debris inside can still catch fire and that fire then can be transferred to the underlayment, the wooden underlayment underneath um, a roof covering and then get into the house. So we always recommend metal gutters with covers over them and more important than anything, periodic cleaning of those roofs. Um, and we find a lot of folks just are unable to do that themselves. And so finding ways we can get folks up there to help them clean those roofs a couple times a year, blow those leaves off, clean those gutters out, because probably more than any other part of the home, the roof is the most vulnerable um, in terms of catching embers and igniting that home. As we move down, again, this is what I was talking about, doing some type of metal flashing where the roof meets other parts of the home, because although the roof may be non-flammable, if it meets a part of the home that is flammable, that's a, a place where embers can collect and then um, ignite that part of the roof. And keeping all those nooks and crannies clear of vegetation, any type of intersections um, is extremely important. Eaves, again, there's a lot of homes that are built with open eaves. These can uh, provide lots of areas for embers to collect. We always recommend that those eaves are enclosed um, and that vents on a home, even if the eaves are not enclosed, any vents have flame and ember res resistant grates over them. Anything from an eighth, eighth inch to a sixteenth inch um, metal screening over those to keep embers from getting into the attic. As we keep moving down the home, again, siding, um, the siding is important, but what I always share with folks is that even if you have wood siding, what's more important is where that siding um, ends up intersecting with the ground, because that is where embers will collect during wildfires. And if there is combustible siding that touches the ground and those embers are collecting there, that siding will then ignite and move up through the rest of the siding or in the sheeting underneath that siding and uh, ignite that home. So by providing some type of a six inch foundation stem wall, six inch metal sheathing around there, something to protect the base of that home from igniting should embers collect against there um, is probably more important than the siding itself. And we understand as, as we talk about this, uh, I wanna be sure folks understand that we know it's expensive. You're, folks are not gonna go out there and replace their entire roof and replace their entire siding um, in a lot of cases because of this. It's just it's just not cost effective to do that. But if folks are remodeling, if there's opportunities to, to change the siding or to change the roof, there are ways to do that that make your home much more uh, um, resistant to wildfire. And there's also small things you can do 
again, by keeping the same siding, keeping the same roof to again, make your home more resistant to wildfire, such as putting something along the base of the wall, such as covering your gutters, et cetera. So there's a lot of things you can do, um, even if you don't make the big changes to still make your home um, res resistant to wildfire. Again, here's what I was talking about when we we're talking about uh, uh, any type of venting into the house. Simple 1 16th inch uh, mesh screening on all those vents um, can make a huge difference in what type of embers get into their home. Any screening that are, is bigger than that allows embers into that home that still have enough potential, hold enough heat to ignite things inside that attic. Inside that attic. If you have 16th in, inch de, mesh. De, después deja que eh, entren las brasas a la casa. O sea, que siempre se recomienda como esa, eh, esa, eh, ese tamaño. Again, y, que, y que las mallas sean eh, así, eh, protegiendo los respiraderos y también las ventanas. Y después vemos las ventanas y eh, las puertas de vidrio. Eh, lo, que, lo que vemos es que en muchas casas que se han quemado es que tienen las ventanas eh, eh, Sí, son las ventanas de, de panel único y después se quiebra ese vidrio y cuando se quiebra el vidrio, después entra eh, el fuego. O sea que eh, es importante que las ventanas no se, eh, no, no se rompan y ahí las ventanas... Pero si hay oportunidades para cambiar algunos windows en la casa, eso puede ser una extremely efectiva uh, medida para reducir el riesgo a tu casa. And then again, outside the home, pretty self-explanatory. Decking surface can be uh, wooden decks, can be extremely flammable, obviously. Um, what's more important sometimes than the deck itself is what's under the deck and also where the deck meets the home. If underneath the deck is clear of debris, there's not stuff stored under there that can be flammable so that embers, if they do get under the deck, have nothing to burn, then in a lot of cases, the deck can withstand um, a fire that's moving through the area. If there's debris underneath the deck, um, if there's leaves underneath the deck and that starts to ignite, then that deck will ignite and then it can transfer that fire to the home. Uh, we also uh, recommend that that um, putting screening around the base of the deck to keep embers and to keep debris from blowing underneath there can also be an effective measure to keep those decks from igniting. And again, anything you can do against the home, whether it be uh, some type of uh, metal flashing where the deck meets the home. So if embers do collect along there, they cannot ignite the siding, um, can make a huge difference. And again, the, the way a home survives a wildfire. And I'm gonna use um, fencing, uh, but anything that connects to the home that's flammable, we view as kind of a, a, a candle wick that can take fire from away from that home, bring it to the home and then ignite the home. So think of anything, again, fences, decks, anything that's flammable that's attached to the home can act like a wick and bring that fire to the home. So breaking that up somehow, if that's um, taking the, the section of fence that's right next to the home and, and replacing that with a metal gate of some kind. So if a fire does burn down that fence, it will not continue all the way to the home. And again, one of the most important things would be that five foot non-combustible zone around the home, making sure that that three to five feet right next to the home contains nothing that can catch fire. No bark mulch, no plants that um, are highly flammable. If there are plants around the home, we recommend they be well watered, raked underneath it, and non-flammable type vegetation. Better than that would be just a three to five foot zone just around the home that has no vegetation whatsoever. So if those embers are landing next to the home, if they're hitting the roof or the siding and dropping down along the base of the home, there's nothing there they can ignite to carry that fire to the home. So that's out of probably anything we're gonna talk about, that can be one of the most effective 
mitigation measures to keeping your home from burning is that five foot area around the home. And it's also the easiest and least or most cost effective of anything you could probably do to increase the resiliency of your home to wildfire is just raking and replacing bark mulch from around the home with river rock, with bare dirt, um, anything that's not going to uh, be flammable is, again, probably one of the most important things you can do to make your home more resistant to wildfire. And again, this is something, and I promised I'd get this to Vanessa as well, um, and we'll try to translate this into Spanish, but, you know, just different priorities um, to your home that we feel are the most important, um, down to probably the least important in terms of um, protecting your home from wildfire. And we also have on here um, what those are going to cost. So you can go through here and in the highest priority, you can also see what's the least expensive, the, the do-it-yourself or the single um, dollar sign. Those are ones that aren't that expensive to do or ones you can do yourself that make the biggest difference in protecting your home from wildfire, right? There's also things in there like the roof um, and like um, some areas around it that can be more expensive that are also extremely important to do. And then as you go down through there, you can see some things that are less important and less important. Although I want to make sure I reiterate that all these are priorities there. We just tried to break them down into ones we think if somebody was, was going to look for the most important things for their home that they'd take into account first. You know, the other thing we want to always share is that to make your home resilient to wildfire, you do not need to make it look like a concrete bunker. And that's a lot of things folks are, are afraid of. We don't want to do it because we don't want our home to be ugly or we want to keep that tree in our yard that my mother planted and things like that. And 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 those things can be done. You can, you can maintain a house that looks um, normal, that does not look like a bunker and still make it extremely resilient to wildfire by just doing some small things. On this slide, some of you may have seen, this is one of the homes that survived the Maui wildfires last month. Um, and again, the simple things they did protected it in a lot of ways from being um, destroyed like so many of their neighbors. They did not have a lot of landscaping next to the house or around the house. They did not have a lot of landscaping that would carry that fire from the neighbor's home to their home and ignite it. You could see underneath the deck in the front of the house, there was not, nothing under there that would um, catch fire and burn and then ignite that deck, which would carry it to the home. Um, and there was enough spacing between this home and the home next to it that the radiant heat from this home, excuse me, from the radiant heat from one home to the next, although I'm sure it was intense, was not um, enough to ignite this home from radiant heat alone. And again, a lot of the things they did for this home were not designed because of wildfire. They were designed because of other measures that they wanted to protect this home, such as keeping it from rotting. That's why they didn't have a lot of things, vegetation against the home because they do live in Hawaii. So they weren't necessarily designed as resilient methods for wildfire, but because of what they did, um, it protected this house from burning um, like so many of their neighbors um, who lost their homes. And one other thing with this that, there was a lot of luck involved here too, because when you have a fire like this, and like we've seen in a lot of, uh, or a lot of fires lately with the high winds, the incredible amount of heat, that sometimes no matter what you do to your home, your people are still gonna lose their homes in wildfire. In certain cases when there is extremely high winds, extremely high heat, that, that people may still lose their homes and we still may lose communities um, in certain situations, but by doing simple things, by doing things to protect not only the home um, and the landscaping around it, that you can protect your home from wildfire. And by protecting your home from wildfire, you're also protecting your community, your neighbors, your family, and your friends. Because if you can keep your home from burning, then you can keep that radiant heat and the embers from that home from transferring to a neighbor's home that transfers to a neighbor home. And that's, again, how you lose neighborhoods. So by everyone doing the right thing, by everyone taking the necessary steps, we can keep communities from burning by keeping one home 
from being destroyed from wildfire. So again, there's there's a lot of tools in the toolbox to keep to keep these homes, uh, to keep homes from burning to the ground, doing whatever you think you can do or the folks you share with can do. Any small step is better than no step at all. And we understand that folks aren't gonna be able to or wanna do everything on here. But by doing a small thing, a few small things, just doing some things instead of maybe everything is is as important, and that can make a huge difference in again the resiliency of a neighborhood and and, and developing wildfire adapted communities. I know one thing we wanted to talk on here as well because we know that no matter what we do, um, we can still get fire in our communities, um, and and you're still going to be forced to evacuate or friends or family are going to be forced to evacuate. Um, and there's a lot of parts to that that are scary. And there's um, a lot of things we need to keep um, in mind on that. I think more than anything is folks need to be able to sign up for their emergency alerts and emergency alerts in their community. And the link I have up here is for California, but most areas have uh, reverse 911 emergency re uh, alert um, signups contact your local fire department or your local uh, hazard mitigation folks, and they can um, share with you that information so that if there's an emergency in your area, that you will get a text or a phone call um, telling you what to do next, and what the situation is and keeping you informed. And so probably more than anything, that's the most important thing your community and your community members can do is sign up for emergency alerts in your community. Um, also, make sure that whether it be from, because of a wildfire or any other natural hazards out there, you always have some type of an evacuation go bag uh, ready to go or, or you know where things are. Because again, whether it be a wildfire or a tornado or a, a hurricane, anything natural hazard related and you need to leave your home in a hurry, you need to make sure you have the necessary things that can get you by for a couple of days if you don't have access to your home or if your home ends up being destroyed, um, that you have the stuff to make your life, keep your life moving forward and keep it as normal as possible. And this is a, this is a pretty um, kind of detailed, concise list of what we feel is the most important pieces. There's other pieces on this. There are, um, if you have horses, pets like that, there's other things you need to consider. If there are folks in your family or neighbors that have special needs, elderly, young folks, um, there's going to be some special things you're going to want to add on this. But again, important documents, um, birth certificates, things like that are important. All your um, banking, insurance information, driver's license, passports, computer backup files and passwords, etc. Um, and just other things on here to make your life as comfortable as possible if you need for need to leave for a few hours or if you need to leave for a few days. Um, one thing we always wanna share is that um, if you're asked to evacuate, um, do so. Don't wait for second notices. Don't wait to see if it's as um, dangerous as they're saying. If you're asked to evacuate, get a head start and get out early. Um, because if you wait too long, obviously, Things can go from bad to worse in a hurry. Roads can become dark, smoky, and confusing. Um, and it can be extremely challenging to leave um, if you don't leave early on. And just remember that, that the fire department, the sheriff's department will be there giving you instructions on where you need to go and how you need to leave. So although you should make yourself aware and make, and make sure your community is aware of where evacuation routes are, just remember that that may not be the route you're going to want to take in certain emergencies because things can change in a hurry. So be ready to go, have your to go bag ready and wait for instructions from the local sheriff's department, police department, fire department on where you need to go, how you need to go and when you need to go. So that's a quick rundown. Again, I think a lot of this stuff I would um, encourage you and the folks you reach out to, to um, develop relationships with the local fire department in your area. 
Um, they can be extremely helpful. They are happy to come out and do one-on-one -on -one assessments of homes. They're happy to come out and do educational outreach with members of the community. Um, if there's populations in the community that need help in cleaning roofs or removing debris because they don't have the resources to do it or they're elderly or they just can't get up on the roof to do that. In a lot of cases, local fire departments, local police departments can um, find those connections to get folks out there or to pr provide the funds to help folks in doing what needs to be done to make their home uh, safe from hazards. So developing relationships with your fire department, finding out what they offer, what services they offer, and how they can maybe help through funding, through getting grants, through your neighborhoods um, is extremely important, as is um, the FireWise program, um, which is a volunteer program that brings neighborhoods together and helps neighborhoods in preparing their neighborhoods uh, become more adapted for wildfire. And so it's a nationwide program. Um, it's under firewise.org and uh, or firewise.com, I believe. And they can, uh, you can uh, contact them in terms of helping get the neighborhood prepared for wildfire. I think that kind of wraps it up. It's a lot of information in a short period of time, but I think we wanted to leave some time for questions um, and my information will be linked to this. So if you have any questions, anything that we can help with in terms of outreach to Hispanic communities out there, um, we'd love to hear about. We uh, we realize that in, in Hispanic communities, just like a lot of other communities out there, some of the education material when it comes to wildfires and other hazards may not be quite as um, available as it is um, for other populations. And by, by you know, us understanding what that is, we can kind of help pass that information along to the folks that need that and can maybe help develop that information. Um, and so you can get that out to your communities. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing screen here because you don't need to see any more of that. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. And uh, I think we can open this up, Vanessa, for some questions. If anyone has any questions or comments, I'm happy to see if I can help answer them. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Doug, for that wonderful presentation. If anybody has any questions, um, please unmute yourself or you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. Any questions for Doug while we have him? Um, I have a question. Are there any like government programs either or funds like federal, local, or I guess like different states that help with, that help homeowners um, to weatherize their homes now that there's like more intense weather conditions? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so there are, yes and no, there are, there, there are some programs, especially when it deals with weatherization, there are government funding programs that can help through loans, through match shares, et cetera, um, for that. There are not a lot of programs when it's when it comes to help hardening homes for wildfire. The good news is, though, that a lot of things you can do to your home that protect it from, um, to become more energy efficient, let's say, to protect it, weather stripping, double pane windows, things like that, also are extremely effective in protecting that home from wildfire. So we are working closely with um, government agencies on trying to get more funding for folks who need it to help um, harden their home, you know, uh, find funds to um, replace windows, things like that to make the home more hardened from wildfire. But there's just um, not a lot out there for the home. There is a lot of funding out there for landscape treatments. If folks need help thinning their yards or, or cleaning up their property and things like that. There definitely are funds out there through that. And again, I would recommend reaching out to the local fire department. Um, they have access to a lot of their funds and they can help people apply for that. Uh, but I would probably, when it comes to the home, look for the programs for the energy efficient programs for that, because again, a lot of that stuff can also work for wildfire mitigation. 
I see there's a hand up. Thank you, Doug. This was um, really amazing information and, and thank you to the Hispanic um, Access Foundation for putting this together. Um, I also kind of in that same um, uh, questions of programming, um, I'm calling from Colorado. I live on the Western Slope in a rural community. And what we've found is that one in every five households in the state of Colorado um, that are owned by Latinos are actually a mobile home. Mm -hmm. um, so mobile homes are really live really close to each other. Um, they don't have a lot of yard and a lot of these are older structures. And I haven't seen a lot of programs where um, making sure that communities are not being displaced, um, especially when affordable housing is, is so hard to come by and there's not a lot of land to continue developing and construction is so expensive um, to specifically target this type of housing. And then I guess my other question too was um, to follow up with that, a, a large percentage of our community are renters um, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the rental properties, um, what we've heard from a lot of um, owners of, of, of rentals is that they just don't have the money um, to do a lot of these um, repairs and the owner, the people that end up living in the home and, and some of the people that we've lost homes already to wildfires, the, the house wasn't even really theirs and they don't have a lot of agency in terms of um, those investments that need to happen when when you don't own the property and, and Latinos in the state of Colorado disproportionately also represent um, the renters versus um, homeowners. Yeah, great questions. So yeah, we do a lot of work on the West Slope in Colorado, and um, and we are actually working with University of Colorado right now and trying to develop um, a paper, a study on how to protect mobile home parks uh, from wildfire um, when it comes to limited. Uh, they're limited funds. A lot of them, again, are renters. They don't own the property anyway. The people who own the property are not very interested sometimes in doing the right thing to protect that property. How do we get those folks? How do we incentivize those folks to do the right thing? And, and how do we require those folks who own those properties, whether it be manufactured home parks or renter people who own uh, income properties, how do we find ways to incentivize them or require them to do the right thing, even if they don't live in that home? Um, and so it's, an, it's a great question. And we are working on that right now. We're actually deep in a couple different studies on that. One thing we did find, we did a, a lot of work down in Austin, Texas, um, where we were able to uh, overlay a number of different layers, part of that being wildfire hazards, part of that being um, Hispanic populations and folks that um, English was their second language, et cetera. And we found that due to housing prices and stuff, a lot of those folks were being um, moved or, or being forced to uh, relocate into areas that were high wildfire hazard areas. Um, and so we worked um, with Austin a lot on trying to find solutions for that, outreach programs, and funding ways to help those folks who were in those wildfire hazard areas to better protect their properties, whether they own those homes or they rented those homes. But I mean, it's a huge question. How do you get those folks who rent homes? You know, that one picture I showed um, was a mobile home park in Oregon that was completely destroyed because of how close they're set. They're not built to withstand heat, obviously. Um, and so we're trying to find ways where folks can retrofit those mobile homes to a stand fire better, that we can provide regulations and recommendations to folks who own mobile home parks on what they can do to those parks to limit those that fire from spreading from one to the next to the next to the next. Because as you're well aware, once those folks, a lot of those folks in mobile home parks, once they lose that home, they have nowhere to go. They, a lot of them are not insured. A lot of them don't have family members that have homes they can move into. Um, and then you just push that problem out. They end up being relocating to other high hazard areas um, that other folks may not want to live in. And so it's a great question. It's a big question. It's one we are trying to wrap our head around at Headwaters Economics. It's high on our list of research. And we're trying to work with um, 
the folks at the policy level on coming up with solutions for that. But I would love to stay in touch with you on getting more input from you on your experiences and what, what you're seeing out there, um, kind of to help us what we with what we do as well. So I think it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer for you. Thank you so much, Doug. And I'll be sharing Doug's information as well in email um, so you can contact him with any other questions you might have in the future. Any other questions right now? Um, thoughts, questions, comments? Um, all right, well, yeah, I, I guess, thoughts? I guess last, yeah, I would just, again, um, you folks are the ones who probably have, you know, hear, hear what's going on on the ground, understand the, the challenges and obstacles and maybe possible solutions out there on, on trying to help, um, in this case, especially the Hispanic communities out there, be better prepared for wildfire. Not only what they can do to their properties, but what they can do to their communities, how we can help them with outreach to their communities, how we can help them access funding, uh, make it easier to access funding. A lot of them probably uh, may not even be aware of what funding opportunities are out there. So. If you have any questions, any comments, any possible solutions that you have come up with in your work with your communities, uh, please pass that along and we can follow up and um, again, maybe uh, help scale this up to other, not only other Hispanic communities out there, but other communities where uh, folks are, are maybe finding the same challenges with finding information or finding funding or, or other things that are out there. So we would appreciate any information you guys have in helping to try to solve this problem as well. And thank you for taking the time to be here this morning. Um, I know I really appreciate it. I'm sure Vanessa does as well. Thank you. We have one last question here in the oh, chat. Um, says, what are the best websites with current fire information on a daily basis we can use as tools? Does anyone know? So th there is a lot of national fire information that's out there. Um, but I think this question may be more referring to kind of what's going on locally, especially with folks, if they see smoke in the air, if they hear things happening, if they hear rumors and how they can spread that word. Um, I would probably contact your local fire department. I think they can then um, lock you into the local website that gives that updated information. Um, what's happening, what evacuation levels are, can people burn? Can they not burn during this time? Um, and then when you have questions from your local communities on that, um, they can they can go to the most updated, educated website that's out there and not get false information um, that may not be super helpful. So um, yeah, again, great question. Great, wonderful. Thank you again. Um, and just a reminder, we do have another wildfire, our last presentation tomorrow on ecology and the impacts of fires and restoration. And for those of you who missed the webinar last week, I will be sending out the recording and the presentation along with La uh, Laura's information. And I'll also be sharing today's recording and presentation and Doug's information. So once again, I'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully, so you can learn more about the fire ecology. But thank you so much, Doug, for all this wonderful information. We really appreciate you and all the work that you do. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely day.